Ours is a social brain. We are hardwired for belonging. And in an increasingly, scientists are understanding this in ways that weren't possible before. The neurosciences now are making it really clear that our brain doesn't think about relationships from time to time. Our brain is preoccupied with relationships. In fact, it's kind of understood or commonly understood that about 80% of what our brain is up to at any given point in time is thinking about our social relationships. If we're not focused on a specific task that requires a specific kind of attention, our brain is pretty much thinking about our social network, who are the people that are around us, where are the people we know, what are they doing, what am I supposed to be doing for them, what are they going to be doing for me. We're preoccupied with it. Often people who are lonely are acting out as a, because of this loneliness. I think it's the most common cause of problem behaviors in people is their isolation. It's not disability, but it's the isolation that often results from disability. People have a several strategies, one of which is if they act out, then they're noticed by the rest of the pack. A philosopher said one time, it's better to have bad breath than no breath at all. And often, my wife Cindy always says, it's almost as if people are afraid they'll disappear, and if they aren't waving their arms in front of us, they will physically uh, disappear from our view. If you can't imagine who this person would be in the absence of their problem behaviors, then with all due respect, you're part of the problem. Because often people, they are so lonely, they have acted out for so long, they can't imagine who they could be in their the rest of the pack, in their re connection to the rest of the pack. Another strategy people have is they often mask their own competence. They act like they don't know how to do things because what that does is it gets people to help them and when they have no engagement. So here's a way that scientists are now thinking of it that's just fascinating. At any given point in time we are literally reading and picking up all kinds of signals from the people around us. Some of them visual, some of them we're processing language, we're hearing inflections and in voices, we're hearing certain choices of words and making all kinds of incredible discriminations about what's taking place in the minds of others from that. But there's even more data than that coming our way. It's thought that we're giving off chemicals that we read from one another. Uh, and as importantly, our, I'm giving off chemicals, you're giving off chemicals, and those chemicals are colliding about mid-space between the two of us and then we're reading the data from that collision of chemicals, that reaction in the two chemicals, uh, streams. Some people believe we're giving off subatomic vibrations that literally we resonate with or connect with uh, a similar kind of rhythm or pattern. It's way more complex in short than they ever dreamed. There's smells we give off, there's all kinds of data that it's coming our way. And the theory is, is that whether we're typical in our development or not, whether we are skilled at relationships or not, the data is coming to our bodies, being read by our brains. But then the real question is, is the thinking brain, the neocortex, a very thin layer of brain on the top of our frontal lobes, it's a tenth of an inch thick, but it's processing uh, our sense of what's taking place right now in the present time. It's what we're doing as we talk with one another, Dave is doing as he's making adjustments in camera, whatever it might be. All of that's being processed in the prefrontal cortex. And whether we can pick up the signals, actually use the data that's coming to us, is determined by how engaged we are in the prefrontal cortex, and that's determined by whether we're afraid or not. So if I'm afraid, I literally can't read the data that's coming my way. And so now think about people who experience disabilities who are very anxious, who have had perhaps experience in their past of failed relationships, who now are meeting people and getting the data, but they can't decipher the data. They can't interpret the data, they can't make determinations about what their next step might be, 
Not because they didn't get the data, but because they literally can't interpret it. There's even an interesting study recently that shows that people that have had Botox therapy are less empath empathetic after the Botox therapy. Because when I see you smiling as you are now, Patty, it makes me smile. And when my mouth moves in that smile formation, there's chemical processes that are taking place that help me to actually feel part of what you're feeling. And if I can't move my face that way anymore, I literally don't get that chemical data. So that was all of this is to say it's more complicated than they ever thought. It's way more than just visual information, auditory information. And it is so much about our ability to make sense of the data once it gets there. And if we're afraid, we can't. This explains, it's thought, why people that are in failed relationships often go back to other failing relationships. You know, you all, we all know the story of someone who's been with someone who's really hateful and they finally break up with that person. And then it seems like the very next person they're dating is equally hateful, equally abusive, whatever it might be. And all their friends will say, why can't she or he see this happening? It's so clear to everyone, but they can't see it. Uh, they just seem to be making the same mistake. The theory here is, is they're getting all of the data, but they're literally not able to read the data. We are not afraid. We're more confident in our relationship. So when we're looking at it from a distance, we're going, how could she or he not see this? So I think that's often what's at issue with people who experience disabilities. We'll teach them skills. How do you greet someone? How do you meet them? And then they'll seem to forget when they start meeting somebody new. Uh, uh, they'll uh, forget they're not supposed to get too close, or uh, Becky will hug uh, people that she doesn't know very well, and this can be okay, but for some people it's not okay. And the idea here is, is that the problem for people is that they're so worried about relationships, perhaps so threatened that it might not work, that they literally can't remember what it is they've, we've tried to teach them to do.